Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out to um, this session this evening on such a beautiful day. Uh, there's probably many places you'd rather be tonight, uh, but we're glad that you're here. My name is Amalia Alarcón de Morris. I am the director of the Office of Neighborhood Involvement in the City of Portland, and I'll be moderating uh, the panel this evening. So um, the other day, I, my husband and I were driving out of our neighborhood, and when we got to the corner of the street where we live, we looked over to the right, and there was no house there. There had been a house there probably a few days earlier, <laughs> but there was suddenly no house there. And we turned to each other and we said, wasn't there a house there before? What happened to the house? Do we know what's gonna happen to the space? And we didn't know any information about it. It was just a complete surprise. So this is happening a lot around the city. There are um, many questions about it, concerns, uh, certainly some heightened emotions um, about the way things are happening or the way people perceive things are happening. And so what we thought to do tonight, what we strive to do tonight, given that any effort to make change happen in a city to improve its livability must include becoming informed and getting organized, that this uh, would serve to provide some further information to you all as community members about some of the questions surrounding demolition uh, among other things. So today we have a panel of folks here that are involved in different aspects of this. We will be giving them some questions and having them tell you a little bit about each of their perspectives. Um, after we are done hearing from them, we will be taking some questions from the audience. We don't have a ton of time, so we won't get to all the questions, but you all who have interest have been filling out question cards as you were checking in. So I will be handed some of those questions towards the end. Claire is holding uh, up some cards over there. So if people need cards, let Claire know. She'll drop by and give them to you and then hold them up when you're done so Claire can pick them back up or some a volunteer can pick them back up for you. If we do not get to your questions, um, the panel members are going to be taking the questions back with them and answering them so that we can email back everyone who's here tonight who has signed in and given us an email address with the answers uh, or responses to the questions that we don't get to ask in the forum tonight. Um, because we want to make sure that we give attention to your questions whether we're able to do them here or not given time constraints. Okay, so um, I want to start, this is the list, I gotta read the list, okay. Um, I would like to thank the Neighborhood Coalition staff who put this event together this evening. Uh, there's some city staff that are here tonight as resource people and also at the panel um, who have been involved. Volunteers are here from Resolutions Northwest, so thank you to them for helping people sign in and get settled, et cetera. Um, we also have volunteers from PSU, uh, obviously our panelists. We wanna thank Concordia University for providing this room that has air conditioning, um, and Portland Community Media, who w is recording the event, so it will play again uh, on CityNet 30 <clears throat> in case you just want to relive the moment over and over again, <laughs> and I know that you will. Um, housekeeping, restrooms are around the corner to the right. Light refresh refreshments are available just outside, um, so if you at any point in time feel hungry, uh, you are welcome to go outside and bring the stuff in here. Just please do not fling anything at the moderator. I guess the panelists either, but certainly not the moderator. Um, so if you haven't signed in, please do so. Give us your information so you can get follow-up information. Get a name tag on if you don't have one. Um, we have some resource people in the room. They're wearing green tags that say resource on them. If you guys will pull, put your hands up, those of you who have green resource tags, and the resource people are also people that have pertinent information to what we're gonna discuss tonight. Uh, the place where you will uh, interact with them most will be after we're done with the panel discussion. There are easels that are located, as you notice, probably coming in around the area that have different topics on them, uh, where the conversation will get to continue after we hear from the panelists. And resource folks who are experts or have knowledge or information about those topic areas will be over by those easels. So that's one way in which you'll be able to connect with them. And also, obviously, feel free to walk up, introduce yourself, and get their information um, if you want to do that. Um, 
Let's see. We also have maps posted around the room, uh, and they'll be available up on the screen as we go as well. Um, and in terms of tonight, again, the purpose is to learn some more about the different aspects of this issue, uh, ask some questions, and get some responses. Um, we hope that the evening will go smoothly, that people will, that we'll all listen to each other um, and take the opportunities available to us and channel our energies into figuring out together what's the best next step to um, getting involved and engaged in this issue. Um, finally, at the very end of the evening, if you choose, you will have an opportunity to connect with the panel members, pick up a printed list of resources and talk to the other folks in the room, as I said, at the easels. Um, so, uh, we are aware of the diversity of perspectives, the strong feelings around the room about this. Please keep in mind that we will not be able to cover all the issues related to demolition in Phil um, or housing and growth and change tonight. Uh, but this is a beginning and as we move forward there will be opportunities for you to tell people what more you want to learn about, what more you want to know about and potentially continue the conversation and continue the information gathering that way. So once again, we thank you for attending and I am going to introduce our panel and then we're gonna jump right into the panel discussion. So starting here and moving to the other side of the table, our uh, first panelist is Sean Wood. He's the construction waste specialist with the city's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Sean works to promote proper material management of debris associated with construction, remodeling and demolition projects. Sean also oversees the city's construction waste recycling requirements. He's been with the city for over 10 years and has experience in permitting, land use reviews, and building design and construction. Thank you, Sean, for being here. Um, our next speaker next to Sean is Kathy Galbraith. Uh, she has served since 1993 as the executive director of the Bosco Milligan Foundation, a nonprofit historic preservation education organization that owns and operates the Architectural Heritage Center. From 1987 to 1992, she was director of Historic Seattle. She was the planning director for the city of Oregon City from 79 to 85, and then director <coughs> of development services in 86 through 87. She is a graduate, a graduate of Pennsylvania State University and received a master's degree in urban planning from Portland State University. So thank you, Kathy, for being here. Our next panelist is Maxine Fitzpatrick. She has nearly 30 years of experience in the successful management and development of affordable housing. She is recognized as a national leader in this field. She was hired in 1993 as the executive director of PCRI, which is Portland Community Reinvestment Initiatives. Under her direction, the dilapidated houses in PCRI's initial 272 unit rental portfolio have, have been rehabilitated and the portfolio has expanded to 700 units. This includes the addition of 30 new units of single family homes and hundreds of multifamily housing. Then next to, thanks Maxine for being here, next to Maxine is Jill Grenda, uh, and she is a supervising planner with the Land Use Services Division of the Bureau of Development Services. She has worked as a planner with the City of Portland in both long range planning and development review for 19 years. She currently manages the planning and zoning staff that provide zoning code information and review building permits for compliance with Portland's zoning code. <clears throat> the Bureau of Development Services, lovingly known as BDS, performs plan review and inspection functions for the city of Portland to ensure compliance with state building code, the city's zoning code, and other city codes. As part of their customer service initiative, BDS is in the process of adding links on their website to agencies regarding health concerns related to air quality, including lead paint and asbestos, as well as general information on demolition regulations and notification requirements and zoning code updates. So that's coming around the corner for you who are interested. And then finally, next to Jill is Justin Wood. Justin is the Associate Director of Government and Builder Relations for the Home Builders Association of Metro Portland. He is also part owner of Fish Construction Northwest Incorporated, which focuses on starter and move up homes. With the Home Builders Association, Justin has focused on local issues ranging from density, street improvement requirements, apartments without parking, and Metro's urban growth management. He is currently a national director for the National Association of Home Builders, 
on a task force at the Oregon State Legislature focusing on affordable housing options and was a member of the Portland Comprehensive Plan Housing Policy Expert Group. So thank you, um, Jill and Justin, for being here tonight. So starting with Sean, um, each panelist will have about 15 minutes, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and we have a timekeeper, so if you see someone furiously flashing cards, that's our timekeeper trying to let us know uh, where we're at. Um, so Sean, reviewing the map of demolitions in Portland, where are demolitions occurring and what are the statistics and trends related to demolitions? Sure, thank you, Vermalia. Is my uh, mic working? There we go. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to look at the maps around the room, but if not, there's one up here on the screen. And this represents uh, single dwelling demolitions or, or house demolitions since uh, 1996 to, to present. Um, the kind of the orange, yellow, and, and red colors indicate demolitions that have occurred over the past decade, and then the cooler colors of kind of blue and green and teal are older ones that happened um, between 96 and 2004. And they're, yeah, it's pretty well distributed. I mean, depending on where you're from, um, there's probably a, a demolition pretty close to you. And there are some concentrations, and this particular map kind of helps look at that. And I know it, it uh, looks a little apocalyptic, but um, that's not the intent. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the same data as the previous map, but this one looks at the relative concentrations of demolitions over that. 18-year um, period, and the, the highlighted uh, kind of red, hotter areas are what you could call the hot spots of where the most demolitions have occurred over that time period, and then the cooler colors, um, obviously less so. So some areas that, that you know, we can kind of note and, and pull out of this um, include Selwood, Moreland, and so again, you know, it's all red, but that doesn't mean that there's no houses left in, in Selwood. Um, <laughs> Uh, Woodstock, the Brentwood Darlington neighborhood, Lentz, uh, Foster Powell, St. John's, Kenton, and Arbor Lodge are all um, some of the neighborhoods that have some higher concentrations than others, and I'm not, I'm not getting to all of them, but um, this map is back here on the uh, stage right. Um, and then in terms of zoning and where demolitions are occurring, um, and again, we're talking just about houses, single family uh, dwellings or single dwelling. Uh, most of them are occurring in the R5 zone, which is our most predominant residential zone. Um, but you can, you can see that, that kind of really tall uh, column are the, the demolitions that occurred from 2009 to 2013 in the R5 zone. Um, and then to a lesser degree in the R7 and the R2.5 zones. And this is a chart showing kind of the, um, the number of permit applications that the city's received for demolition permits. So um, orange are the, the houses and blue are commercial. And you can see kind of 2006, 2005, we peaked with, with housing demolitions um, just prior to the recession. And then during the recession, they took um, kind of a notable dive. And then since 2010, uh, 2011, they've been on the increase, and last year, so 2013, they're around uh, 273 demolition applications. And then trying to project what 2014 will look like, uh, we pulled numbers from January 1st to June 9th, which was Monday, um, for both 2012, 2013, and 2014. Um, so kind of year to date uh, for, for all three of those years. And in 2012, we had 73 demolition applications. 2013, that rose to 120. And then this year, we're at 141. So certainly on the trajectory to probably close to 300 um, demolition applications for this year. And then <coughs> it's typically not polite to ask a person how big they are and how old they are, but it's okay with houses. And <laughs> so uh, dem demolished houses, the, the average between 96 and 2011 was 1,119 square feet. Um, and the, the average new house built in Portland is around 2,075 square feet. Um, the national average, just for comparison, is 2,500. And then the, the average year built for the, the demolished house, so when it was originally constructed, is 1927. 
And then kind of breaking that down into a group of, of ranges, um, houses that were built in 1864 to 1911, um, from 96 to 2011, there were 429 demolitions. Um, 1912 to 37, there were 658. And then 1938 to 64, so kind of the post-war period, there were 698, so most of the demolitions fall um, within that category. And then a, a lot fewer um, after 65 to 2011, there were only 51. So the, the vast majority are over 50 years old. And I just want to um, be clear that the, the numbers that I'm sharing with you and, and the ones that are on the map uh, don't include major alterations. So these are just demolitions. So something where a, a house is, is you know, a kind of a whole house remodel, these don't include those numbers. But, and they're, they're a little bit harder to tease out than demolitions, and that, that's one of the reasons we're not focusing on them. Um, but from what we can tell, they're on a, a similar trajectory as demolitions, so they're on the increase. They're predominantly in the R5 zone, um, and they have similar Im impacts as demolitions. Now, Sean, what can you um, tell us about uh, whether all this development activity is increasing density? So the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, the, you know, we, is this working? Yeah. All right, there we go. Um, so for the, this, this slide uses 283 total demolitions and, and I, if anybody wants to ask me why there's 10 more in this one afterwards, I'll, I'll go into that. But just uh, for discussion purposes, out of the 283 demolitions that happened in 2013, it yielded 553 net units or, or lots. So, so the short answer is yes, it did, did increase density. Um, you know, what type of development is following demolitions? Well, the, the majority, at least a larger proportion, um, are single-family houses just being replaced with single-family houses. So 42.8% um, were a one-to-one. -one. So we didn't get any additional density. So that's that first row. Um, lot confirmation and land divisions, those are essentially creating new, new lots or recognizing pre-platted lots. Um, and those yielded 72 and 74 um, additional lots. Um, so smaller number of land divisions, but um, kind of a healthier amount of, uh, of density um, compared to lot confirmations. And then I think what's really interesting about this is that there were only 25 demolitions in kind of non-single dwelling zones. So these were, these were in multi-dwelling zones or commercial zones. Um, so that, that relatively small 8.8% of the demolitions yielded 407 additional kind of net units. So that's where um, typically we'd like to see uh, you know, additional density happening are in centers and corridors, and that's, that's what's happened with relatively few demolitions. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're moving to uh, Maxine Fitzpatrick. Um, individuals and families are relocating because they cannot afford to live in inner Portland. What are some of the factors that prompt relocation or displacement, and how can this be countered? Thank you. Um, I'm going to show you uh, shortly uh, um, a map that will, it's not really a map, but it is an overview of a map that kind of shows you the transition that happened in uh, Northeast Portland where we are focused and do our work from the period of, say, 1990 to 2010. But, um, <clears throat> and one of the things that we are grappling with, first of all, I just want to say that PCRI, we do community development, so we have done infill. In fact, we did our first infill probably in 1995, where we took a little single family home that was on a 100 by 100 lot and put five units of affordable housing. And we've done quite a few projects of that magnitude since that time. I think the difference, um, working at it and looking at it from a community development perspective is that we did have quite a bit of interaction with the neighborhood associations, so much so that one development we were trying to do, the neighborhood association did not approve it, so subsequently we weren't able to do it. But 
Fast forward to 2010, we are again embarking upon doing uh, infill development, mainly because of the displacement that has happened in Northeast Portland that came along with the establishment of the Interstate Corridor Urban Renewal District. Um, it was planned with that district that it would be some displacement because this was really uh, an area of the city that had great housing stock, but due to years and years of disinvestment, it had primarily become the concentrated um, home area for lower income individuals, the majority of which, um, I won't say the majority of which, but a huge number of them were African Americans, and it is in the city of Portland where you have the greatest concentration of African Americans. And so, predictably, when you invest in an urban renewal area and you bring public resources to bear to restore and reinvigorate the community, um, People want to take advantage of that. They want to move in and be able to take advantage of the low prices now and the higher values that will eventually happen, such as what did happen in Northeast Portland. And in that process, it um, displaced, um, just from the period of 2000 to 2010, it displaced over 10,000 uh, households. I'm sorry people, and most of those were African Americans. And that's the, uh, yeah, there it is right there. So you can see in 1990 what was there in PCRI, we was actually formed in 1993. So your 1990 picture is um, uh, there. And then you fast forward to 2000, the Interstate Urban Renewal Area. Investment actually started happening in Northeast Portland prior to that. I'd say when the CDCs were really active and engaged and going through the community, eliminating the worst uh, looking housing and the worst maintained housing and then rehabbing it and putting it on the market and put, moving families in it. Then Northeast, you know, really is a very attractive place anyway. People were interested in moving back and being able to live in this area of the city and many of them did. So starting in the late 1990s and with the establishment of the interstate urban, re uh, with the interstate um, urban renewal area, came an influx of probably a hundred, couple hundred million dollars for investment into the, that area. And from that came the light rail, made the city and the area much more livable. It's a walking city. Many of you stay here, uh, have been here a long time and can see the transition that happened from the corridor on Alberta to the corridor in Mississippi to now the cor corridor at Williams, Vancouver. And so most recently, a lot of uh, controversy over the MLK corridor. But... Um, and so our focus has been, as a community development organization, doing infill that would alleviate some of the strain and stress that it has placed through displacement on families that resided in Northeast Portland, um, you know, prior to the investments. So what I hear from residents who know that we are a community development organization, they come in, I can remember the first person I heard say that was Chief Charles Moose. I was at a meeting and he was complaining about the church and the center being built and how it took away his view. He saw the West Hills. He could no longer see the West Hills. And so now, fast forward to today, some of the complaints that I will hear around demolition and development comes from residents, you know, um, when the lot next door or the home next door is sold. Somebody comes in, tears it down infringe upon their property line. Now they're too close. They don't have the privacy anymore. Now there's 10 families living there where it was only one old lady before or one you know, senior man. Um, so it it's just has been a very interesting dynamic watching the transition uh, as well as um, the demolition that comes with expanding the density in, in, in Northeast Portland. Um, and like I said, we've done quite a few of them, but we work really, really hard to make them fit into the fabric of the neighborhood. The largest one that we've ever done has been eight units, and it was on a 100 by 100 lot, and it was plenty of room for it. So um, I think that's about sure. Right. So as a follow-up, what housing options are available for those who would like to stay in their neighborhood? 
there are hardly, I would say zero to maybe 10% uh, housing options in the neighborhood. And that's one of the reasons that we have been working now for about four years, uh, finally created a project called Pathway 1000, where the intent is to give 1000 displaced families, involuntarily displaced people who should not have been displaced because there were commitments made by the community, by the city, and by the leaders that said, we will make sure that you will not be displaced. And so we created an initiative that is only projecting to bring 20% of the families that actually got displaced out of Northeast back. And so that's what we've been working on. And some of that is infill. And uh, it, it's it's uh, not high density, but you know smaller units. The largest one being 42 units. And there's some senior housing over and back in Irvington Covenant. So unfortunately, we haven't done a real good job as a city uh, to look after you know those people that were so vulnerable to displacement. And then I guess a final question for you. How can our community continue to grow equitably without letting market pressures determine where we live? What are your thoughts on that question? That's a very good question. And I often think about it in um, respect to how it was in the neighborhood that I grew up in. It, uh, we tend to want to concentrate um, households of a certain economic status all together. And I think that is something that we as a nation have resolved to, but it hasn't always been that way. When I was growing up, I lived right down the street from my dentist, right down the street from our doctor, right you know, down the street from the pastor in the church. So we were all there together and what differentiated you know, someone that had um, quite a bit of discretionary income from someone who just had enough to survive is the size of the dwelling. Everybody took care of what they owned, though, but it was the size and the appearance of it that kind of let you know that they don't have very much. But I think we all need to be in a neighborhood where, where there's inspiration for people who have historically uh, suffered disparities in housing, education, economic development, employment, the whole nine yards. And there's quite a bit of it that exists. So and I think when we clump all the uh, people living uh, at a certain economic status together, we deprive them of that opportunity and we do our community a disservice. Thank you so much, Maxine. Thank you. Now to Jill. Um, Jill, please tell us about the latest requirements around demolition. How are neighbors notified? What are the requirements? What is the difference between demolition and renovation? And you guys all promised me you're going to give me that same round of applause, <laughs> OK? So I have some visuals. They're not as snazzy as the ones you've already seen, but I put mine on the wall over there. Um, and I put them in sort of a descending order. If I would have been taller, I would have put the notice of public hearing at the top and then stacked them downward because those four notifications represent the three tiers that we administer of required demolition delay and then a voluntary notice that BDS is just about to release. It's at the printer, which is why I had to bring a mock-up of it rather than a real example. So BDS administers two zoning requirements for demolition delay, and then one that's contained in Title 24, which is the city's interpretation of the state building regulations. Um, we mostly use state building regulations, but they don't address demolition in any way. So the city code actually put a chapter about demolition in it. And I think it was originally adopted in 1988 as part of our enforcement relating to dangerous and abandoned buildings. And it's been amended a couple of times and has sort of grown from there. But starting at the top, so that super boring official looking sign on the far left, notice of public hearing. So you would see that for structures that are National Register listed historic landmarks or contributing structures in a National Register historic district, such as the Irvington Historic District, which is the newest one that we have in Portland. So if somebody wants to demo a contributing structure in that district or a landmark building, 
they come to the city and it goes through what's called a demolition review process. So that's a land use review. So just like any land use review, the city notifies neighborhoods. We notify the coalition, the neighborhood association, property owners that abut the perimeter of the site for 400 feet. So renters wouldn't necessarily get notified, but the actual owner of the house would. Um, for that level of review, we also notify some other agencies, TriMet, Metro, and ODOT. For some reason, they all want to be notified of National Register demolition proposals. So the decision goes before a historic landmarks commission and they make a recommendation to city council. So the ultimate decision is made by Portland City Council. These don't happen very frequently. I think we have two of them under review right now. That's an actual sign there that I borrowed from uh, the historic review team. But I would say in an average year, we might get zero of those. We might get two or three. I've never seen more than three in a year. Um, so that's the highest level. That's in the zoning code. So the second level that's in the zoning code is a demolition delay review. So that would apply to properties that are contributing structures in conservation districts. So there's uh, the Kenton Conservation District. It's a lower level of historic protection. Um, and it also applies to, the city has a historic resource inventory um, that we did for some other reasons a couple of decades ago. Property owners can actually opt their property out of that inventory with a letter to the city. So sometimes we have to give them that message. They'll come in for a demolition permit and we'll look at our inventory and say, gosh, you know, you're actually on this inventory. We need your permission to take you off of the inventory. So properties in those circumstances have a 120-day demolition delay requirement that is characterized by the second sign. It's just, it's all really small font, but it has a map on it and a description of the proposal. So the first process is asking the question, can we demolish the structure? And sometimes the answer is no, quite frankly. The second process is basically, you can demolish the structure, but we're going to give people a really long time to try to find an alternative to demolishing. So it's 120 days. That sign is posted at the site for most of the 120 days, and then the permit can be issued after that. So if you're not a historic property falling into either of those categories, then the Title 24, which is the city's building code, has a chapter um, regulating demolition delay for residential structures in residentially comprehensive plan designated properties. So it's a little bit, and most of those have a residential zone, but the title actually refers to the comprehensive plan designation being residential, so a slight nuance there. So. That title says if you're a residential property um, and you've got a residential home on it, then you need to delay it for 35 days, sort of to give that same ability for you know, an alternative to be talked about or suggested to the developer for that structure. There is one exemption, or exception I guess is more correct, in Title 24 where um, if you are submitting a new building permit for a single family replacement structure, so it's only one to one, you're asking to take away one single family house and you concurrently are permitting a new single family house on that site, um, then you're exempt from that 35 day delay period. So that leads me to the fourth level that's, as I mentioned, at the printer, so BDS, um, because of all the concerns about demolition that we've heard lately, have been working with the development community to ask them, you know, can you extend, and many developers already want to be good neighbors and they'll knock on doors, um, and they were very amenable to doing a voluntary notification. So what, if you go up after the presentation and look at the little white mock-up of a door hanger, so for those properties that those few, that subset of um, residential demo permits where they get that one-to-one -one exception, 
we're going to give them a set of like 10 door hangers and a set of instructions on where it should be posted and what other organizations they should notify. And there's a little map on the right that will be the set of instructions the developers get. And it basically suggests um, hanging the door hanger on the two properties on either side and a few across the street and a couple behind. So to alert people to what's going to happen, because we don't, you know, we totally get it, then if you come home and there's a house that used to be next to you is gone, it can be very jarring. Um, so any other kind of structure besides residential structures, um, and, and I should clarify residential primary structures, so we don't require any kind of demolition delay for garages or other accessory structures that are on residential properties. We don't require demolition delay for commercial structures or commercial or industrial properties. So it's that Title 24 um, delay just applies to residential st primary structures in residential zones. Um, okay, if you're still awake um, after all that, um, I had a couple other things to tell you about. So. You heard the moderator say this at the beginning as part of my bio, but BDS is about to launch a new demolition information web page um, on the BDS website. Um, I feel like I'm, I need to move this closer. But it, it will give information about um, the Title 24 demolition delay process. It'll provide links to the, um, it'll also give you some information about where to look at the Title 33, the zoning code demolition delay process. Um, there will be some facts there about how Title 24's demo delay was initiated and how we regulate it. Um, and then it'll also direct you to other resources um, and some of them are here tonight, and you can talk to them about, you know, what agencies in the state regulate some of the byproducts of demolition, like the, you know, the asbestos, if that's occurring, lead paint, et cetera. So we just want to be able to give people the correct resources of the agencies that regulate the various things. Um, and then I think one of the questions I was asked to address was, um, what's the difference between a demolition permit or a remodel? So the difficulty that we always have is that there aren't any state or local codes that give us a definition of demolition. So in residential zones, we permit buildings according to um, the Oregon residential, residential specialty I'm not a life safety plans examiner, but it's the state building code. Um, and I just looked at it today, and there isn't a definition for demolition. The zoning code doesn't have a definition for demolition. So we've taken a very literal view, like a dictionary definition, that if you're removing the entire structure, including the foundation, we consider that a demolition. Um, we totally acknowledge that the slide you saw where there was a foundation and floor structure and nothing else um, can provide many of the side effects, if you will, that a full demolition will. But we currently do allow that process to happen through an alteration or um, a remodel permit, essentially. Um, and then, you know, after demolition, we've heard a lot from our customer base about why can more than one house replace a, an old house that gets demoed? And, you know, what we say, because we implement these processes as well, is that land is being divided all the time. Um, historically platted lots that might exist in a site that have been combined into a tax account, um, they have some historic development rights in some circumstances, and they're being brought back through processes that allow that. Um, so essentially, the zoning allowances are being built out. Sometimes there's more development potential under that single house um, than you really realize just by having it next to you. Um, so I think that concludes what I have to tell you. Um, <clears throat> so, Jill, you may have already um, fully addressed this, but um, which projects are subject to which requirements? I, d I don't know if you actually 
fully touched on that or did not. Are you asking me, are the, does the slide that shows nothing but the foundation and floor structure left, the alteration slide, would that be subject to a notification requirement? Is right. that your question? So if, if you look at the previous question, we asked about the requirements around demolition. And so just offering another opportunity for you to touch on which projects um, are subject to which requirements around demolition. So the, the levels of demolition notification that I described at the beginning, that would apply to demolition permits, so where every single bit of the structure, including the foundation, is proposed to be removed from the site. So none of the levels that I'm talking to you about would apply to anything less than that. Um, I mean, the historic landmarks, you know, you, there's a great deal of regulation around those properties. Um, so you would be going through the same kind of process for an alteration permit to do that, to do a, a large remodel like that as well. Great, thank you. Um, back to Sean. Um, Sean, what is the difference between demolition and deconstruction? Sure, so um, this is probably what you typically see on a, on a demolition of, of either a commercial or a residential structure, and they're, they're typically carried out by mechanical means, so an, uh, an excavator or a track hoe comes on site and, and physically removes the, the building, and you know, from, a, uh, from a cost and, and efficiency standpoint, the best thing to do is to, I can't think of a better word than, than crunch um, the material up so that it fits into either a drop box or, or a, um, a truck to haul that off. And then um, you can see on the, the picture on the left there, that's a commercial demolition, but oftentimes the excavator will use the, the debris from the, from the building as a step to reach taller uh, parts of the structure. So that results in even more kind of pulverizing of the material. Um, and you know the oftentimes they'll set aside uh, high value recyclables like metal, um, but otherwise most of it goes directly to a, a sorting facility um, where they sort through the material to pull out recyclables. And somewhat contrasts with deconstruction, with the, which is um, somewhat of an alternative to, to traditional mechanized demolition. And with deconstruction. Uh, deconstructionists go on site and um, physically by hand remove the building materials and they do it in the opposite order that the uh, structure was constructed in. So they start at the roof, uh, work their way down, pull off the siding, the windows, go into the interior and, and pull out wood flooring. And the, the primary goal of deconstruction is to salvage as much building material for reuse as possible. So reuse, if you kind of look at the, the waste hierarchy, you know, it's reduce, reuse, recycle. So um, it's not to say that, that recycling is not bad, um, but reuse is better. Um, <coughs> and then one of the benefits of, of deconstruction is that those materials uh, that you have left over that can be reused, so whether that be flooring or windows, can be um, either sold or donated in many cases to a nonprofit. And those nonprofits um, in turn resell those, those building materials at a discount, um, so compared to what you might be able to buy it um, at a national retail store. And that can result in a, uh, a tax deduction for the owner of, uh, of the building. And then, you know, in the case of something like uh, Habitat for Humanity, when you donate materials to um, their restore, the, the money that they make from, from those transactions directly goes towards providing affordable housing um, for the Habitat program. And also deconstruction results in more jobs. Um, you know, it, it takes more people to, to take down a house by hand than it does to operate an excavator. Um, but it also results in, in really high quality. Um, a lot of times the lumber is old growth uh, fur that, that you really can't, it's really difficult to get your hands on these days. Um, and then it obviously leads to, to more community development is more, more sustainable. And um, can you tell us what happens to the waste associated with teardowns? Sure. So um, 
just in terms of how much waste comes from a de demolition, so this is regardless of whether it's demolished um, uh, with a track hoe or an excavator or, or hand disassembled with deconstruction. Um, so earlier we talked about the size of the average demolition being 100 and, uh, or 1,119 square feet. And then the, the average waste per square foot associated with a residential demolition is around 115 pounds per square foot. And then if we assume, you know, this year uh, we're looking at around 300 demolitions, that results in 19,000. Um, 303 tons of waste that's generated from from just residential demolition. So that does not include uh, remodels or or new construction. And just to put that in perspective, in terms of all of our municipal solid waste from from kind of all sectors within the city, um, that's closer to 450,000 uh, total tons. And. These are kind of somewhat simplified, and they're they're going to you know vary depending on the actual project. But for a, a typical demolition, um, they're at the end of the day about 75 percent of the material actually ends up in the landfill, and then only 25 percent is recycled. And so again, they they send the material off to a, a sorting facility where they kind of hand pick through the materials and set aside wood and cardboard and metal um, for recycling. But I think especially with with demolition versus maybe um, new construction, given the, the kind of the pulverized nature of the the materials, that's really challenging to to sort those um, materials, and so a, a large percentage of it ends up at the landfill. And then you contrast that with deconstruction, where the the goal is salvaging building materials for reuse. You're going to have a, a really large percentage that of that material that actually gets reused. Um, you know, around 20 percent for actual recycling, and then 20 percent of it would uh, end up in the landfill. Great, thank you. Um, those of you who asked for cards at the beginning to write questions down, I don't know if you've passed them over to the aisle for our volunteers to connect, collect. So if you haven't, would you please just pass them down to the aisles? And uh, those folks that are sitting on the aisles, if you could just hand them over to volunteers. Um, anybody else need a card or want a card, put your hand up or come up to one of the volunteers that are holding up cards. Um, and just make sure to make them legible, please, so that um, if I get one of your cards, I can actually read what you wrote. Great, thank you. All right, uh, moving on to Justin Wood. Um, can you describe the factors that encourage developers to choose demolition in residential areas? Well, one of the things that I, I guess I want to start with, because I think this leads to demolition and infill, for that matter, and, and why it happens is, um, for anybody who's not a long-time Oregon resident and hasn't been around for many years, I just want to give a quick little history lesson on how we are and kind of why we got here and why we have so much infill and demolition in Portland. And over 40 years ago, we passed Senate Bill 100. And when Senate Bill 100 was passed, that placed a, that gave a mandate to the city of Portland, to Metro, and all our jurisdictions around here to make policy choices to preserve a tight urban growth boundary with a goal to preserve farm and forest land. So that led us into the 2040 plan. And the 2040 plan was, devo was developed by Metro. Um, and that requires all the cities and jurisdictions here to determine what their inventory is for new housing, where they can place new housing, and where new residents moving into the area can go. Um, for a little bit of context, right now the Metro is going through the, the next the growth cycle for the, the urban growth report for the next 20 years. Um, they project that in the next 20 years, um, approximately 725,000 people will move into the Portland metropolitan area. Um, currently, we're about 2.3 million, so that will take us over 3 million. The urban reserves around our urban growth boundary, if they were fully expanded, would only add about 10% more land to our urban growth boundary. So if you do the math, that's 700,000 new residents on at most 10% more land than we have now. Um, the consequence to this, good or bad, depending on your perspective, is that the bulk of all new housing will be in fill and redevelopment. Um, the city of Portland, as part of their measure and exercise for what they do with Metro, did an inventory on what their capacity is for single family new homes and multifamily new homes. Um, and I wish I had, I had brought this chart, um, and I'll show you the second, but the city's capacity, and now this is just a snapshot in time, there's not a horizon on when this will happen, but 
a snapshot of this current zoning of the city by their numbers say that we have capacity in the city of Portland for 15,000 additional single family homes, 42,000 low density multifamily homes, and 171,000 high density multifamily units. So that's 228,000 additional housing units within capacity within the city of Portland. And you know there's not a lot of vacant land within the city of Portland, so that has to happen on infill and redevelopment, a large portion of that. Um, I apologize, I didn't have a slide for this. This little chart, if you can see, represents all the cities in the urban growth boundary and what their capacity is. And they're all very small little numbers here. The line that goes all the way out to here is the city of Portland. So the city of Portland assumes the responsibility for a large part of the growth for the Portland metropolitan region. So with that said, the factors that encourage developers to choose demolition is, is really land. Um, throughout the recession, nobody was developing land out in Washington County, Clackamas County. It, it, all the banks and all the big developers stopped doing that. So what was the safe bet for people was to come in here and do infill housing. Um, there's still a very high demand for new homes here in the city of Portland. It's a very desirable place to live. There's a lot of people that want to live here, and there's a very low supply of houses. Um, if you look on, we have one of the lowest inventories across the nation right now on whether it's old homes or new homes for families and, and people moving into the area. Um, there's a lot of desire for people to be closer in to the city, um, which you know does have the benefits of meeting some goals, whether it be you know reducing transit needs, reducing carbon emissions, and various other things like that. Um, so, you know, the really the, the, the reason for demolition is, is there's a demand for housing out there and that's, and that's what builders are doing is they're trying to meet that demand. Great. Um, I didn't mean great, I meant great, great you finished the, <laughs> answering the question. Should clarify that. Um, <laughs> what pushes developers towards demolition rather than renovation or remodeling? A lot of times, um, if you look at the chart that was up there earlier, um, a, a lot of times it's because there's a, there's a greater zoned capacity for the land underneath. Um, if the home is sitting on top of two lots, you really can't remodel or renovate it if you want to take advantage of those two lots that are both there. Um, and sometimes the, ho the some of the older homes just, um, we, we had one last year that we tore down, um, and we just did a one-for-one -one remodel, I mean a one-for-one -one replacement on it, but the, ho the house was in such poor disrepair that it would have taken more to remodel the house than it would to be put a new house up on the site. Um, uh, and, and there is an underlying demand for new construction versus older homes. Um, there's, there's a reason newer construction homes typically carry a higher sales price than older homes. Um, whether it be market perception or buyer perception, typically there is a premium placed on new construction home, and there's not a lot of new construction in Portland, so typically when they get built, they get sold fairly quickly. How does the context or character of a neighborhood affect what will be built? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's hard to speak for every builder out there because, you know, we do this, some, we've done this sometimes with my construction company, and we generally try to be somewhat sensitive to the neighbors. And I, I can't speak for every builder, because I know there's guys out there, just like there's bad neighbors, there's bad builders out there. Um, that said, one, buyers, there are buyers have wants and needs, and, and you know, people will ask, why is that 3,000 square foot house being built in my neighborhood, yet if it's, if it's so, sold immediately, there was a, somebody wanted it. So there's, there's that. And okay, let's, let's, let's let Justin, <laughs> let's let Justin continue. But, you know, I, I will say to that, those are families moving in there. Yeah. Those, are, oh, those, are, yeah. those are not, those are new families, those are new people. Okay, if we could just let Justin finish answering the question. We, we're asking him for his perspective. We know that there's different experience that says different um, in the room. And there'll be an opportunity to actually have a dialogue later on as you're moving to the resource easels and having networking with others and talking to the resource people. Um, so if we could just let Justin finish and then we can move on to hear from Kathy. The, the, only, the only thing I'll add to that is Portland has one of the most comprehensive zoning codes of any city in the nation I've ever seen. The Portland zoning code is this thick and I'm not exaggerating that. 
there's a lot of guidance that is given to builders as to what you can and can't build. The Portland Comprehensive Plan is going on right now. Portland gives the opportunity for neighbors to be a part of that context so that you can help shape what can be built in neighborhoods. Every jurisdiction in the state and in most jurisdictions around the country, the reason for that zoning code is so that you have a framework as to what you can and can't build. Design review is the other option that the city of Portland provides that basically says, you follow these rules and you can build it and you don't need, unless you're in a certain special district, you don't need special rules and you don't have to go through a special review How, because these have been gone through the process and these are the rules. If you don't follow these rules, then you do have to do a design review. You do have to go to the neighborhoods. You do have to get permission. And, that, and that's what the city's always tried to do and that's what we've always tried to ask the city to do is give us two paths, one that we know we can do and the other one that we, if, if we can't do that for some reason, then we can go work out another solution. And then um, finally, Justin, are there suggestions that you have for folks who aren't happy with changes in density, size, and design of new homes in their neighborhoods? Well, the, if you're not happy with density, that comes with that, that's a choice we've made as a region. Um, and that has to come from the elected leaders we have. Um, if you don't like it, you have to tell your city elected officials, your metro elected officials, that we don't want the density. But there's a consequence to that. Realize there is a consequence to that. That means the urban growth boundary has to be expanded, and that means people have to go someplace else. And I, the other part to that that not a lot of people realize, and some, I'm sure other people can attest to this, if you don't build any new homes, that's not going to keep people from moving here. All that's going to do is the people who can afford to move here will, and that'll drive up housing prices because there isn't supply for other people. But they'll so. go up faster. But uh, the, uh, the other thing I'll say to that is if you want... If you want to be a part of the situation, be part of the comp plan. I mean, be part, you know, have your voice at the city, and Jill can attest to this. That's what that's for. Be a part of that and help choose, how, help shape how new homes get built in the city. Thanks, Justin. So now um, I'm going to move to um, Kathy. Kathy, how do you see the current trends in demolition of homes and new infill housing impact community and neighborhood stability? and equity. Please talk about this from your perspective and experience as a longtime community advocate and leader, as well as in the social, cultural, and historic context of the communities that you've been working with. Well, I really learned a lot from the other presenters here, and I'm kind of glad I'm last because there's things I don't have to say now, and there's some other things that I think I need to say. Um, I want to start off with a little context about this because I'm not sure that all of us got into this deliberation and debate, you know, from the same place. First off, I, I refuse to call this what's being constructed as infill. Infill is building something on a vacant lot. What we're doing is we're demolishing and we're building new housing. And that's, to me, that's just the facts of the matter. So we call this demolition and redevelopment at the Architectural Heritage Center. Um, we kind of got immersed in this with the proposed demolition of the Bridges House. In, um, in Goose Hollow, and given the fact that it was an 1880s house with a really significant architectural style and quality materials, um, I think we were rather stunned that this demolition kind of came out of nowhere, and the developer filed his request to be let off of the historic resources inventory, which the city automatically grants. Um, the same day that he filed his permit. Now, admittedly, he offered the house to anybody that wanted to move it. That's the easiest offer to make. It's the most difficult um, thing to achieve, as we found out when we participated in the battle to save the Rayworth house that was moved from North Albina Avenue. The Alameda house, the 1947 brick house that was clearly of great quality, I think was sort of another shocker for us and the media and the community. And it, I think, led us all to believe this really can happen anywhere. And it was, I think, the real wake-up call. There was a 120-day delay put in place that then, for reasons I don't fully understand, the rules got changed, the demolition proceeded anyway. And I think people were really left confused and upset. And I think just trying to understand how the process unfolded would have... I think made people feel a little more comfortable with what was happening. Three days ago, I got a call from a woman who owns a house up in Willamette Heights, which is really off the beaten track, great neighborhood, high quality houses. You don't go there unless you live there because it's not on the way to anything. 
And she told me that there were some Google people from San Francisco that were in town and had just bought one of the houses that the neighborhood clearly perceives as a mansion. And it's proposed, she tells me it's gonna be demolished and they're gonna build something new there. The no permits filed, but it really can happen anywhere if, um, if that's really going to come to pass. But, you know, as a historic preservation education and advocacy organization, we're most concerned with the historic properties. All the historic but unprotected properties, like the 5,000 buildings that are on the historic resources inventory that dates back to 1983, has never been updated, designations never been, been, been um, undertaken for that whole body of properties. And I think that's what... Um, we're seeing a lot of concern about houses that people just really think of as truly vintage, strong history, strong architectural character, strong social history as well. But, you know, we're seeing a lot of good quality houses that clearly are candidates for rehabilitation, the greenest thing that you can do, that are instead being scraped away and being replaced by housing for all kinds of reasons, which everybody has articulated here tonight. And it has a lot to do with the erosion of community and neighborhood character. Um, which is, I think, one of the things that um, we're all most concerned about. This isn't the first time that this has happened in the city. In 1987, the city did a very thorough 86-page study on demolition of residential housing stock. The c concern then was the loss of affordable housing. And that study says between July 1 of 1982 and June 30th of 1986, 625 housing units were lost. The study concluded that the loss has not been significant enough to support the introduction of strict controls over the demolition of residential structures. And the city looked at some options like a demolition moratorium, determined that wasn't supportable, uh, talked about making demolition delay provisions land use actions. So you have the formal application notice hearing procedure. And we're concerned that that would result in um, a really cumbersome process and would be too expensive and um, administratively too cumbersome. And then this waiting period between application and the issuance of demo permit, and um, that was adopted for a period of time, um, but then it was waived again as we're doing today with for applications with an approved building permit so that if you, as was explained to us, if you file your new, new house permit the same day as your demolition, there's no notice requirements. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is politics, and I think we all are, all of us are smart enough to know that. This teardowns are a phenomenon that have happened periodically nationwide, and now it's come to Portland. Um, what we're losing is neighborhood character, and we're losing them one house at a time. Please, just... Let's all figure out how we're gonna to get to some solutions. I think, I think that's the challenge here. Um, what struck me about the 1987 study is how much concern there was expressed for neighborhood character and its potential loss. It's all throughout that study and that's the thing that we all believe I think is missing, most of the panelists think is missing um, in the discussion today. Uh, social, cultural, and historic context is the question I was asked to, um, to address here. Um, ironically, the social and, and cultural aspects of this are an essential part of the three-legged stool that is used in the national definition of sustainability. And it's the social and cultural aspects of sustainability that to me seem to be singularly missing from Portland's approach to sustainability. We focus mostly on economics and the energy and environmental aspects of, of sustainability. And we ignore the social and the cultural context for the most part. Um, with demolition and new development, we lose our older people and our elders who are either downsizing, are moving to senior housing, or are um, moving to nursing homes. And lots of times you have you know children that live at a distance, or maybe they live in town, the house has some condition issues, and it's really easy to respond to an offer of an all-cash close-in days um, offer that I'm getting in my mailboxes at least two every three weeks. I've figured it out um, how often they come. Um, we lose the older people who might want to downsize if there was an option, because if they live in a big house, might want to downsize into a smaller house in the neighborhood, but they can't afford the bigger houses um, that are there. 
And so the houses are instead being, you know, purchased by somebody, demolished. And I've heard surprise expressed by the owners who actually responded to these offers, sold the houses. They never asked what was going to happen to it. And within a month, they see their, the house is gone and they're ex expressing surprise about it. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. We're losing the potential younger people, the starter families who would like to be able to move into an affordable house in a close-in neighborhood with the character that everybody cares about. They're, they're the people that are looking to put down roots, start a family, become the next generation of dedicated professionals and volunteers and people to work in the coalitions and in organizations like mine who don't have the opportunity to become homeowners, which is, was, has always been challenging to become a homeowner. And now it's, it's much more difficult um, because those starter homes are being eliminated as an option for them. And I often wonder where those young families and, and young adults who are planning to start families are going to go. We lose the ethnic diversity in those neighborhoods. Maxine talked about the fact that there is no majority African-American neighborhood in North Northeast Portland, and I think that started with the Albina Community Plan. I think that was the sort of the starter planning effort that, um, that started that phenomenon and the, the push out of people who could no longer afford the, the rising property values and certainly couldn't afford the rents. And when a lot of rental houses were turned into owner offered on the market, you know, cleaned up a little bit, prices considerably raised and then offered for sale. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people lost their, the housing that they had counted on in the neighborhood as property values rose. And that's why you go out to East County, or what was called East County and now is East Portland, and you see every ethnicity on the face of the earth. And you know where so many of those people were, um, came from. And I can't imagine that it's more pleasant to live out there than it is to live in any of the Albina neighborhoods. Um, we add to the, just adding to the growing problems of gentrification, which has been all over the media as a major phenomenon. Everybody, I think, is trying to accept responsibility for their role that they might have played in that and trying to figure out what to do about it. And the, the question that I ask is, you know, where's the equity in all of this? This is the new lens that city programs through the Portland plan, city programs and plans are supposed to be looked at in terms of equity. Are we fairly benefiting all populations, all people, all backgrounds. Um, and, and then I think the other issue is that, you know, that we're really seeing um, erosion in neighborhood stability. And, you know, we all tend to, I think, know our neighbors. We know the older people that need to have somebody look, to, you know, look in on them. We know everybody's kids. We know the kids that shouldn't be playing in the streets. And, you know, everybody, when you're in a neighborhood for a long time, you tend to look out for one another. You know, in the late 1980s, the Loma Prieta earthquake brought segments of the San Francisco Bay Area to a halt. And one of the findings after that earthquake was that poor crime-ridden Oakland actually had a really strong social network. And those people all helped one another to get through the first days of the earthquake when there were no, certainly no public services or public assistance. And, you know, they, they came together and really survived pretty well. And um, now Oakland is where you go when you can't afford to buy a house in San Francisco. And it's gentrifying. It's lost many of its renters and its lower income people. There's a housing activist in the Bay Area who's um, a strong historic preservation advocate. And he said, who would want to depend on the people that have moved into Oakland now to save you after an earthquake? There's just the, the networks have disappeared. You know, the, you know, the startup kind of cool businesses, the people that have just moved in, got their guard dog, put up their bars on their windows until they feel their street is safe enough to be able to be joined by other people like them. And, you know, and I'm, I'm not picking anybody out to criticize. This was his observations. He said, you know, who's going to be looking out for you? People that are, that are new are probably going to be looking to you as the old timer to help them figure out what to do. But it's just an observation of what I think a community that's a city that's been disparaged over recent decades as being so poor and crime ridden actually has some strengths. Um, and as for um, the real environmental and energy impacts, you know, Richard Moe, the past president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, said, why recycle bottles, cans, and newspapers and throw away whole buildings anyway? <laughs> Thank you.
There is a study that the National Trust Green Lab, Preservation Green Lab, which is based in, um, in Seattle, put out, and they did a study in 2012, before all of this stuff really started cooking here, um, called The Greenest Building, and it's on their website, which is preservationnation.org. Um, it looked at six test communities around the country, and it looked at what it would cost to renovate an existing building for a particular use or build new. And it was all different climates, Phoenix, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Portland was one of the six test cases, so it's just fabulous for us because all the information is there. And what it found that the, a new house in Portland will take 50 years to overcome the impacts of its construction. Among its findings, it presumed that Portland would demolish 1% of its building stock over the next 10 years. So between you know, 2012 and 2023, 1% of the city's housing stock is gonna be demolished. The study concluded that by retrofitting and reusing them, instead of demolishing and building new energy efficient housing, not just new housing, but new energy efficient housing, it could meet a whopping 15% of Multnomah County's total CO2 reduction targets over the same time period. To me, that seems like a pretty good trade-off because we're still trying to deal with the carbon footprint issues. And by rehabbing perfectly good housing stock, we can meet that goal as well. I was really interested. I had some, I, I think, some assumptions, misassumptions that I've made about how many buildings are deconstructed and how much material is actually saved versus what's going to the landfill. And Sean's information was, was really interesting, new, not necessarily encouraging, but good information to really understand how that phenomenon works. Um, and I guess, that, I guess that covers it. I'm seeing the one minute sign anyway. <laughs> So we, uh, just another question for you, Kathy. Um, could you, you, and you touched on it a little bit, uh, I think, in your context setting. Can you share your observations of the community sentiment and what can possibly bridge the unintended or intended consequences of the changes that are happening? You know, I'm not really sure what the intended consequences are. I can, I will say, and I'm, I am absolutely thrilled that Justin came and came into this room to deliver messages that none of us really want to hear. You know, but somebody had to do it, and I'm thrilled he agreed to do it. You know, I spent 11 years as a, as a, a municipal planner in the metro region. I've never, I didn't work for the city of Portland. I was the planning director in, in Oregon City. And I defended the urban growth boundary and the DEQ, emissions stuff, you know, sign codes, code enforcement, all those things that you do in a smaller jurisdiction, and including heading up the development of a new comprehensive plan that we spent 88 public hearings getting through. Um, the question that I tend to ask is who's in the driver's seat? And you know, I believe that those of us that have lived in the community for a long time, I've just celebrated my 40th year in Portland in January, and have participated in a variety of you know, initiatives and, and activities you know, over the years that we really should have some say in what happens in our neighborhoods. Now how we get to that say, I think is, is the challenging part. I was recently told of a metro counselor who was on a walk on Southeast Division, which is the commercial street in the neighborhood where my house is, where all the new apartment buildings are going up without parking. And I was told that he was there with a group of Richmond and Hosford Abernathy residents, and he was saying, well, this will all be gone, looking at the residential north side of Division Street. And, and, I, and I, when I was told this, I got livid, and every time I think about it, I kind of got madder and madder. And then I read something recently that, a, that a, a senior regional planner at Metro said, and he said, for a long time, the character of Portland and other cities in the region was a collection of neighborhoods, and we still have that, but now something new is happening where it feels like we're becoming more of a real city, and with that comes some growing pains and something about distinguishing Portland from being a real city, which to me it's always been, I found a little frightening. Um, when um, we're, I guess I, I guess I will close by saying this. We have a blog post that um, that I recently posted last week. There's copies of it out on the resource table, and I would ask you to pick it up. My email address is written on the front page. What we'd like to hear from you are some ideas and suggestions for fixes 
to what's happening because there's things that the city clearly can't do and there are things that the city can do and there are things the city could do. And um, when we talk about one of Portland's strengths being its celebrated neighborhoods and then we don't do anything or much of anything to protect them, I think that's, that's a challenge that we all have to deal with and I think the solutions to that are, um, are political. But among the things that I think we need to do is we need to advocate for uniform public notice. And I know that if there are builders that are great builders and great developers who are willing to voluntarily do this, but unless everybody's on the same page and doing this, I don't think it's going to work. I think we clearly need to change the, demoli the, the definition of demolition to something that is more reasonable. And there may not be a formal demolition or formal definition of, of demolition in the state building code. And Jill, I didn't know that. But there are local jurisdictions around the state that define 50% or more loss or destruction of a building is when you move into new construction. If, you're, if you've lost 50, if you're taking down 50% of the building, this is not an alteration. And I, and I, so if you've got 50% of a structure remaining standing, I think if other cities and counties can work with that, I think Portland should be able to work with it, but we have to propose it. Um, houses that are obviously historic but not protected, which is the majority of, uh, less than 1%, it's considerably less than 1% of Portland's housing stock is protected by a historic designation, um, is a big issue for us. And we think that there should be uniform public notice for any houses on the historic resources inventory with at least a 120 day delay and that you should not be able to just opt out of the HRI automatically. And I think you can make a case that if the owner didn't protest to being included on in the inventory when it was created, then you gave up your right to protest now. But um, there are also a lot of houses that are more than 50 years old since the, resource, the historic resources inventory was done, so we need to do that. And then we think that the front, or the, the front and the side yard setbacks should be maintained for new housing. <laughs> And the last thing that I'll say is the state legislature prohibits design review of, of single family homes unless you are in special regulatory districts. So asking for that is not going to work. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, we. <laughs> we are going to move on to ask some of your questions. So if I can. Anybody, anybody who hasn't uh, turned in your cards? There's one over there. I think this might be one of those things where I stick my hand in the bin and pull out a winner um, randomly. So hopefully that will work. Okay, um, first question, and, and, and I'll ask the question, and if there are people on the panel who wanna tackle it, just jump in, uh, or, or perhaps you can signal me if there's more than one of you so I can make sure everybody has a chance to speak to it. How do we show our support for the, quote, fixes to codes and notices detailed on the back of the AHC paper? Kathy's suggesting the blog post. That's where the, the, the fixes are listed. Anyone else want to offer any suggestions? I heard also Kathy talk about the comprehensive plan. Um, can, that that's an opportunity at least to talk about some of this. Yeah, and I Go can uh, somewhat address that. Um, so yeah, certainly the uh, providing your input on the comprehensive plan is, is something you could do that's kind of looking a little bit more long range. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in providing comments um, about existing, existing code, so whether that's Title 24 or, or Title 23, the zoning code, Title 24, the building code, um, BDS governs uh, Title 24, um, and then BPS governs Title 33. And we have uh, essentially uh, forms that you can fill out to make suggestions for changes to those. And as, as part of the follow-up for, for this event, will anyone who's provided us with their email address will send you that information on where to, to make those comments. Okay. 
Um, we're actually going to allow you guys to mill about and talk to these folks after. I just want to get to as many of everybody's questions as we can before we let you all um, mingle together and network together. So I apologize for that, but I, I just want to make sure that we get as many of these uh, some airtime. This question is for Jill. Um, and so there's a little context and then the question. So it says, neighborhood associations want the ability to protect neighborhood character. We need a mechanism to protect certain qualities in certain areas. An example is this R5 neighborhood we are in. It is constantly being built in at R2.5. That modifies the zoning to our detriment as residents. How will neighborhood associations be allowed to control and influence development in the new comprehensive plan? So it, it may not actually be a question for me because it's the Bureau of Planning that is looking at the new comprehensive plan. But what BDS does is basically make sure that the existing zoning allowances are followed. So I know that this neighborhood does have historically platted lots that make up some of the sites that people have come to expect seeing in the R5 zone, 50 by 100s but many of them were historically platted as 25 by 100s. Can you guys still hear me? OK. Um, so Portland has gone through a number of legislative planning efforts over the last couple decades where we've asked the communities, um, do you want to give these historically platted lots some grandfathered rights, if you will? And what the answer has been is yes in some circumstances. I think that question could be looked at again. Um, the Bureau of Planning can speak more to the different planning efforts where that might be an opportunity. Um, and maybe Sean would want to address that now. But essentially, you know, that's why a neighborhood like this, just by the fact that it had many of those historically platted smaller lots, you will see some of it develop at the R2.5 density. And by that, I mean one unit for every approximately 2,500 square feet of site area. Does that answer the question? Did you want to add anything to that, Sean? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'll add, um, I feel like this isn't working, but um, is the, the, the comp plan uh, comes out July 21st for public comment and review. Um, so there's certainly an opportunity and, and encourage um, folks to, to comment on that. And, uh, Again, that's something that we can provide a link to when we follow up, but um, the, the website, if anybody wants to jot it down, is um, portlandoregon.gov and then backslash PDX comp plan. Um, and there's, uh, there's forms there that you can fill out and, and comment either from a geographic standpoint or just a content and policy standpoint. Next question, please address the lack of proper disposal of hazardous materials such as lead and asbestos as part of the demolition process. <laughs> I, I can tell you that, um, I think I mentioned this in my presentation, but um, just to be clear, BDS, uh, the city of Portland doesn't regulate hazardous material disposal. Those, there are state agencies that regulate that, but we do want to provide, help direct customers to contact the right folks. So we are adding information to the BDS website. We've always had a web page, you know, contact these agencies for these things, but we're um, adding some of that to the demolition information page to sort of get it clear. So if you actually just go on and put demolitions in the search engine, you'll get to that information as well. And I'll add, again, I can't speak for all builders when I say this, but we, we test every house we, for asbestos because that is, I mean, I know there's somebody here from DEQ here. It is a huge fine if the builder, I mean, I, I've heard of people getting tens of thousands of dollars fines for getting caught tearing down a house with asbestos and not remediating it. So we always do, and most reputable builders I know do as well. Now, I can't say there's not fly-by-night guys that don't, um, just like there's, prob there's probably people that do their own remodel work at home that aren't checking for lead paint or asbestos. And, and that's, you know, and I'm not saying that's not a, a threat to everybody as well, but that's, you know, a, a dangerous health hazard for everybody. And so, you know, there's, there's the issue of home demolitions and, and home renovations as well. What percentage of existing Portland single housing 
stock will be sacrificed for greater density. Single family housing stock? Opinions? Um, I don't have an answer uh, for that, but I, I did want to point out, and I, I mentioned this in one of the earlier earlier slides, that you know, 42 percent of the demolitions for 2013, and, and so how that is historically, or how it'll play out for 2014, are one to one. Um, so that a, a house was taken down, and only one was put up in its place. So that's not not increasing density. So close close to half of these demolitions, it's it's not entirely um, a density question. Um, part of it is just the market and, and folks either, you know, as Justin mentioned, wanting new construction or potentially larger homes. You know, I, I don't understand who the people are that have the financial ability to buy some of the new houses that are coming on the market after something's been demolished at the prices that are at. I don't know, I don't know who this population is, and I guess it's my obligation to try to, and we're trying to figure out by hearing from people about where these things are happening in, in your particular neighborhood, trying to do some analysis to figure out, you know, who are the sellers, who are the builders, who are the buyers, and it's going to take a whole bunch of information to be able to determine that. But, you know, it all starts with a willing seller. Somebody's got to sell a property for something to come on the market for somebody to buy and get demolished and then be followed up with new construction. But I, it, I mean, it could be the sky's the limit, could be the capacity of this. I don't want to believe that, but I want to be proven wrong. I don't, I don't want to take us on a, on a side trip, but I, want, I just want to make sure everybody realizes, I think when we're thinking of these homes where everybody is thinking of the, the old home that gets torn down and a 3,000 square foot new home gets built, and I know those happen, but there's there's other ones too. I mean, we don't build those. Most, I mean, we built we build a lot of homes out in like Lentz, for example, where we may take down a 1,500 square foot house that's not in very good condition and build two 1,400 square foot new home construction homes that go into families making less than medium family income. So it's not everybody buying these houses. It's buying these huge mega mansions. There's 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 a mix of all of them, and I, I realize there's there's houses on both ends of the spectrum, but realize that there's there's both out there. So following that up, how does demolishing middle-income family housing and replacing it with two smaller houses or one large spendy home affect housing affordability in Portland for mid-sized housing? It increases it. It increases it for sure. And I think that that, like if we look at what happens in Northeast, um, everybody is pretty much familiar with our office, and I get constant comments on it all the time. When we purchased that building in 1999, that's when we purchased it and rehabbed it afterwards for our offices. Now you cannot even buy a two-bedroom bungalow in Northeast Portland for what we paid for our office, you know, 14 years ago. So, um, if you don't know Maxine's building, you should know it. It's a huge, very historic, very intact, highly stylized absolutely exquisite building that people drive by there and go, oh my God, that's still there, what is it? <laughs> so, but I have just watched from being in the community and involved in housing, have just really, really watched what has transitioned and how it has priced out, you know, even um, people who earn median in 100% in, uh, of the area median income. It's, it's a very difficult, um, situation that we find ourselves in. So most of the people will say, you know, the house that I got now, I can't afford it if I had to buy it today. And so for those that are fortunate enough to say that, it's, it's a good thing. But for those who are buying now, it's, it's really difficult. And, and, and we live, and you know, I think about this a lot because we do live in a capitalistic society. You know, everybody wants to see their money grow and be able to afford different things. But I think how we do it oftentimes in disregard to uh, the overall community is where, you know, we, we enter into to the problems. We could build... Um, 10 or 12 units, but because we know what that would do to the neighborhood, we choose to, you know, try and maintain the existing character. So I think it's going to be 
coming, you know, I serve on the Development Review Advisory Committee, and I'm learning a lot from that experience, and I've only been on it a couple months. But you do have varying um, positions, and I think the way they come together and try to resolve this issue is also the way this community, we can come together and resolve and resolve it. So, um, What are the limits of size on a new single-family home replacing an existing single-family home, or are there? So the size limits in any zone are determined by the zoning regulations and in the R5 zone, I mean, uh, which is most of what the residential area in inner Portland is, the allowances of the zones, the setbacks, the height, the bulk of the building, those allowances haven't changed essentially for the last 35 to 40 years. So we're just in an economic condition now where it makes sense to tear down some older homes and build out to the allowances of the zone that have been there for decades. So in the R5 zone, the height limit is 30 feet. The side set and side and rear setbacks are five feet from the property lines. You have to be 10 feet in the front. And guys, this isn't new. This has been in the zoning code a really super long time. So if you want to change it, that can be done through legislative processes that change the zoning code. I'm so sorry, say that again, again? The, the, we have to, I have a whole bunch of questions here I want to try to get to. So, so I, well, I didn't, I didn't add building coverage. So there's a building coverage, which, so you can't just build out to those setback limits. Um, depending on the size of your lot, there's sort of a sliding scale, if you will, of building coverage where you get to cover about 40 to 50% of a residential lot. It varies by size. So we've only got a few more minutes before we um, let you go and uh, do some networking. So I'm going to maybe a couple more questions. This one's for Maxine. Um, you cited the low rate of replacement housing in the interstate urban rural area. What happened to the 20% set aside requirement? Would that not indicate a higher rate of affordable replacement units? The requirement, the commitment, the goal was never honored, so they just never did it. It just never happened. An unfortunately short answer. <laughs> okay, um, for developers and their subcontractors who have repeated DEQ violations, can they be tracked by the Bureau of Development Services and those developers be held to stricter requirements? No. <laughs> I mean, we, we just don't track DEQ requirements. I will add, though, if they have multiple violations, I'm surprised they be, state can still be in business because the fines get astronomical very fast. Okay. Um, 30 seconds. Okay. How many demolitions resulted in a reduction of units, and how does this square with the city's commitment to density? know the answer to that question uh, as far as reducing so I assume that's about uh, a, a multi dwelling structure that was was taken down for a single dwelling structure and I'm not I'm not aware of any um, but it hasn't been anything we've looked at directly okay um, all right so we have a bunch of questions uh, the folks on the panel have agreed to take these and craft some responses to them which will go back out to people's emails uh, in a follow-up. Um, so first of all, I want to say um, thank you to the panelists. Um, thank you to those of you who are here. I see um, at least one of our elected officials in the room um, and representative from our city mayor. So. Um, Lou Fredericks is here, and uh, we have a representative from uh, Mayor Charlie Hales' office that's here also to listen and hear from you all. Um, so there are a few ways to sort of craft some next steps. Um, first, our organizers will be sending a follow-up email with additional ways to connect around this topic. 
Um, like for example, the Building a Better Portland Facebook page, some information about the comprehensive plan that you've already heard about here. Um, there's Kathy's invitation to submit fixes to her blog, so uh, make, make sure to do that, and then she can uh, put you on that list. Um, and then outside, there will be issue-specific stations, as I said, um, where if you want to connect with resources and other community members around a particular topic, this is your opportunity to do that. Um, resource folks, with the green tags, we ask that you head to a station that most closely fits the work that you do. Um, we realize there might be some overlap. Um, so these are the, the folks that are resources. Uh, we haven't had a chance to uh, talk to every single one of them, but the ones uh, that we that have identified that we've gotten to, uh, we have representatives from Oregon DEQ, we've got Jeff Fish Construction, we have Development Services and uh, Planning and Sustainability from the city. We've got the Home Builders Association, Restore Oregon, Builders, Architects, a realtor, uh, we have PCRI, we have DRAC, uh, Portland Collective Housing, Oregon Community of Tenants, uh, Keep Portland's Older Homes, and Bosco Milligan Foundation. So, um, so the groups that are up front include affordability, codes and regulations, design and neighborhood character, displacement, environment and sustainability, health and historic preservation. Um, to conclude this part of the event, uh, again, I want to thank all the organizers who put this together uh, for coalitions. So if you'll stand up, if you helped organize, you can stand up. Uh, these are your neighborhood folks. Thank you so much. Um, again, our panelists who volunteered their time, their expertise uh, to fearlessly help us understand <laughs> the issues uh, a little bit better. Um, and again, all of you for being here on a beautiful summer evening. So uh, go, mingle, eat some food, and thank you again, and stay tuned. <laughs>